which was awesome. Don't get me wrong. I'm 16, 17. I'm earning 30 quid a game of on a Saturday. Shot, yeah, it? it's awesome. But then I signed with my contract and I wanted to £50 a week. Ooh, Ooh, balling. What? Balling. balling. Give me the balling. money. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Fozcast, the Ben Foster podcast. Before we get started today, I just want to say a massive, massive thank you to every single one of you who has listened, subscribed to all of our pods so far. We've only got three out, but at the moment of speaking, we are number one in the sports charts on Spotify. And I have not got a clue how we have managed that because, boys... Get on. Have we not just winged the life out of this? Yeah. We, <laughs> we, we have winged it, honestly. Well, it's just three, three mates chatting shit, isn't it, really? <laughs> Basically. Absolutely th- insane. That's exactly it. We have just winged it. We get some nice people in. We speak about absolute gumph, but it seems that you guys are enjoying it. So long may it continue. Up the Fozcast. Let's get into it. Today, I am sitting in the podcast room with Rhino Legs Tom. Frank, the editor, and we are going to talk about my career, the ups, the downs, the highs, the lows, the good, the bad, the ugly, all the indifferent, all the funny stories, all the in-between bits. Should we get into it, boys? Yeah. It's burp. It is about 400 degrees in here today. It's very warm in here. I've got a little fan behind the screen. You can't see it. I am keeping myself nice and cool. Ben's got two fans, prima donna, you know. Me and Frank, we're just left to sweat it all out. Yeah, we're just here dying. I'm the talent guys. <laughs> talent. I'm the talent guys, all right? You've got to look after the talent. Cheers, Ben. Thanks. Yeah. Right, so Tom, uh, Ryan Legs Tom is the guy coming up with all the questions, all the talking points from today. I have not got a clue what he wants to talk about, but he wants to talk about something because he says I've got a wicked idea for the Ben Foster podcast. So let's get into it, boys. Let's have it. Go on, Tom. Yeah. Long career. Long very, career. very low. You're an absolute dinosaur at this point, aren't you, mate? I, I feels like I'm a dinosaur, <laughs> mate. Every day when I get out of bed, especially at the minute, it's pre-season at the minute, guys. It's hard work getting out of bed in the morning. I am creaking. I'm cracking. It's hard, but it's fine. It it's is all it good. Is. It's all good. It's well, pre-season. Let's, we've just finished the Euro. So what? 10 days ago, a week ago, 10 days ago, the Euro's finished. Give us your little wash up on that. Okay, so you know, obviously, I got tickets to the final, so I took Louis to the final, which I've got to say, the actual inside the stadium was was fantastic. It was absolutely brilliant. The um, the atmosphere was was top class. Didn't see no trouble whatsoever inside the stadium. Me personally, uh, obviously, getting to the stadium and after the game. Can I just stop there really quickly? Inside the stadium, there was booing. On the national anthem. Yeah, for sure. Which I, you know, you, I knew that would happen. I yeah. did. I knew that would happen. And I was really happy you brought it up in the vlog as well. Yeah, I, I, I disagree with that. I think anybody's national anthem, you yeah. have to respect the yeah, national totally. anthem. It's That's just common courtesy. When we talk about in this country, though, hooliganism, football fans get a bad rap. And people often say, it's the small minority. It's a small minority. Well, the booing of the national anthem, booing of the national anthem, is unacceptable, and that was not a minority. No, now, that was her, uh, that is a large percentage of the stadium booing that. Yeah, for sure. I think, I think that that side of it is what really does give England as a country a bad name. I think if you look in the comments on my on the video I did for the vlog of obviously going to the Euro final, there's a lot of different nation fans getting in the comments and saying that yeah. the that side of it is what makes the rest of the world basically not want England to win. That, yeah. that is what it is. It's that kind of hooliganism, booing the national anthem, all those kind of things. It just doesn't go down well, but I don't see why people need to do it. You know, you just respect, it's, 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 it's a minute. Not even that, the Italian national anthem is a banger, yeah, isn't it? It's, yeah. it's it is banging. such a banger. A, is it, this banging. is a cultural thing though. And I don't always like the comparison between rugby and football. I don't always like that. And, you know, I played both growing up and it just wouldn't happen. Not in rugby. No, it wouldn't happen. No, it wouldn't happen in rugby. You I know, think this is is this a grassroots up thing? Yeah, I think for me the problem on the day was was the fact that it was an eight o'clock kickoff and literally everybody was just yeah shit faced. They were absolutely <laughs> shit faced. Yeah. You could just tell. People were walking like zombies. They were walking up Wembley Way like zombies. Was that not the Rona though? The it, old super spread. Honestly, they, it, everybody was out of their head um, already drunk because. You, They'd been on an all-dayer. Do you think it it would be different if it was a midday game? 
Yeah, it would have been different. I'm still, I'm still pretty sure they would have been booing in the national anthem. Mm. Um, but let's, you know, that that it, it is what it is, and I think we need to learn our lesson well, from let, that a little look, bit. Let's sure. look at the positives because you were in the England setup for a long time, being being at like a, a number two as such. You might not have had the caps, i.e., forty fifty caps, but you were in the setup for quite a long time, weren't you? When you were in the setup. What was the dynamic like? Because you hear of that generation of the Gerrard. It was the the Man United and the Chelsea or the Arsenal. Were there cliques? For sure, massive cliques. There were, um, like I say, you used to have the Man United clique um, and you would have the London clique, the Chelsea's, the Arsenal's. Um, and that's for sure how it was because there was probably six or seven players from Man United. There were seven or eight players from Chelsea, Arsenal, all that, and they would. There were certain different tables. Um, it wasn't it wasn't spoken about and it wasn't a, an obvious thing because everybody did get on, but there was always that sort of underlying belly And look it. at it now, from the outside looking in now, when you look at the lads, I mean, they have been world class. Yeah. Both brilliant on the pitch, but to bring the country together, I've kind of, over the years with football, I kind of drifted away in terms of that fanatical kind of feeling. But now that we've both got lads that are at an age where they love it, I feel like they've really garnered the nation. I mean, what's it like as an ex-England player looking in now? I, yeah, I totally agree. I think we've all found that connection back again, haven't we, with the national team and we want to get behind them and we want to support them and we want them to win. And don't get me wrong, when you lose a final, there's going to be a little bit of upset about it and we should have done this, we should have done that. And, you know, that's kind of by the by. That will ha always happen. But I would say that we are much better at the minute of getting behind our team and supporting them because they are so much more personable. I think people have really started to see the personalities of these play players. And because we're allowed so much more access to them through social media platforms, and through the way that Gareth Southgate allows the media to come inside and really yeah. you, get, you get a feeling for what these people are like. It humanises everybody. And I think that's the bit that's been lacking for a long time. So what I loved is, and there was a little bit of, uh, it depends on which side of the fence you sit really. So after the final, some of the lads went, uh, uh, what, was it Mykonos or Portugal or somewhere, they went away together and you've got uh, different players from different clubs. And as a fan looking in, I think that's brilliant because they finished their time and you can tell they're not going to go on holiday together if they don't get on. They don't, there isn't yeah. that real unity. So looking at it and I think they've, they've been together for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. They've worked their absolute bollocks off, came really, really close. And they're going and having a good time together, and you think you, you can't, nobody yeah. can begrudge them that. It's nice, isn't it? It's just like they're like lads. They're just like normal lads going on all day having a nice time. Yeah, <laughs> but they've all got about ten mil in the bank. <laughs> <laughs> good living, good living, good living, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, brilliant. Now nah, I'm super proud of the boys and what they've done. Um, really enjoyed the Euros. Um, and I think after everything we've been through for the last year and a half, it did bring everyone together, like you said. Um, Come right. on, boys, bring it home. Never Incredible. mind. Um, Qatar, we'll go, what is it, 2022? Qatar. Next year, isn't it? Yeah. <sighs> Soon comes around. December. It certainly does. So, right, we've done England. Brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. Let's get back onto the career pod now. So take us back to the absolute start because we've had lots and lots of people saying I want to hear more about your stories Ben even when we had Thogden in the guest and he's like I want to hear your stories and and you're like well this is your podcast <laughs> you know it's about you guys so it kind of prompted us and said let's do a career, a career podcast so where did it all start because you didn't have a conventional route into football did you no it, I didn't at all um completely completely the opposite way of what it goes nowadays. I think you are finding a lot more players that will do it this route now, like the likes of Jamie Vardy, even Chris Small and players mm -hmm. like that, who have gone the route of playing for semi-professional teams and then getting a bit of a break and then finding their feet later on, like in their early 20s. So I left school at 16. I was a chef for two years at Cafe Rouge in Leamington Spa. I was playing non-league football for Racing Club Warwick, who's my local semi-pro team. And... I was doing well. I was, you know, I was I was playing some decent football sort of thing. I was still obviously a very young goalkeeper, 16, 17. And one, you know, one game, a Stoke scout came and saw me play. And that's it. I eventually, they came in and bought me. I remember them buying me because I had actually, obviously Racing Club Warwick, 
knew that there were teams looking at me. So they made me, not made me, but they kind of sneakily got me to sign a contract. Which like, is what anyone should exactly, do. Exactly, really. Yeah, they got me to sign a contract. And to be honest with you, I was quite happy I did as well because I wanted to to make sure that they got something out of the deal. You know what I mean? If 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 Stoke were going to pay some money to somebody, I'd rather it go to Racing Club Warwick. And Absolutely. they didn't get a lot. They, I think it was something like £5,000 up front. But in that level... It's massive. It's big. Five grand's massive. It really helps. And, yeah. and when you signed for Racing Club, your contract, what did you get? Like a bag of hula hoops as you sign on? <laughs> mate, mate, I was on. Um, I was on thirty pounds a week per game yeah. before the contract started, right? And then, which was awesome. Don't get me wrong. I'm sixteen, seventeen. I'm earning thirty a few quid a game. Of hoop on a Saturday. Yeah, it? it's awesome. But then I signed my contract and went to fifty pound a week. Ooh, balling. What? Balling. balling. Absolutely Give me the money. Balling. <laughs> so I was like Splashing. balling on 50, bag, 50, 50 bags a week. Yeah, you wish 50 like pound that. a week. Yeah. So I was like the highest paid player in the team, like going all to all the older lads, going unlucky lads. I was cashing them off all sorts. Of <laughs> I might be getting a 1.2 Renault Clio soon, lads, unlucky. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, that was, that was pretty cool. But then obviously Stoke came and bought me and then I signed for Stoke City. And like I said, they paid £5,000. It could have rose to a certain amount on appearances, but it's never really, really, really materialised. But my very first contract at Stoke City, I was on two hundred and fifty pound a week. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, though, I'm eighteen years old and I'm a full time professional footballer on two hundred and fifty pound a week. I'm living in digs, and I didn't have anything to pay for. It yeah. was I was living the life. Honestly, I just turned pro. It was incredible. And when you were at Stoke. Um, what league were they in at the time? Stoke were in League One at the so time. So like the Championship? No, one no, below the one Championship. Below that. Yeah, they're because in League One. Where, at your time during Stoke, obviously you got loaned out a lot, um, but you had some real kind of colourful characters and it was like you entered football at kind of like a time where it was like the last of the old guard, wasn't it? So you had some like big old bruises in the changing room. John Rudge, was he was like director of football? Yeah, Stoke, yeah, sure. And who was the manager when you... The the first manager was a guy called Gudjan Thordeson. Um, right. He was like an Icelandic guy. They had a, they had a massive connection with an I, with the Icelandic with an Icelandic team. Stoke did so they had always like Icelandic players or Icelandic managers, people like that. Um, he was fine. To be fair, I never really got to see him much. I'm kind of in the youth team, reserve team at the time, so I didn't have much sort of um, contact with those sort of guys. But yeah, that was at that time you had some real old school like people like Jerry Taggart, then Peter kind of Handyside, guys, Peter Handyside, all those was kind of guys. Hoekstra there, Peter Hoekstra, who else? Dutch, Dutch midfielder, lovely player. By Carl the way. Henry, Carl used Henry. To Kick about yeah. with Carl Henry, yeah, didn't he you? was the guy who got me into gambling. Cheers, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice one there. No, I think I'm guessing he was earning a couple more quid. Than he you was definitely the earning more money than me. Yeah, for but sure. There were some good, talented players at the time. So you, in the youth structure, that had good careers, weren't there? Yeah, there was. Like say, Carl Henry had a good career. Um, Richard Chris, Keogh, Richard Keogh, Chris Commons, Chris Commons, Chris yeah, Commons yeah, who yeah. had a lovely left foot. By the way, he had some really bad injuries later on in his career, which sort of really hampered him. But he yeah. was a lovely player. He was for class a while. at Celtic. Wasn't really, he? really good. Um, Andy Wilkinson, players like that. Um, the goalies at the time. It was funny because we had we had Ed De Hoy. Do you remember Ed yeah, De Hoy, yeah, yeah. goalkeeper? He was incredible. Lovely, honestly, what a lovely bloke. Um, but he was nearing the end of his career. But he, he didn't care. He, he would just come in every day. He to wear a bum bag he, he didn't care <laughs> like he, yeah he, he was just he was just having a nice time but lovely bloke Neil Cutler was a goalkeeper Steve Simonson uh, Mark Crossley for a little bit real yeah, sort of yeah, old yeah. school goalkeeper but like people like Neil Cutler you're still friends with now aren't you and for you... sure yeah for sure very good goalie coach Neil Cutler really good goalie coach he was my goalie coach at West Brom for only a season and then he got sort of snapped up by Villa really quickly but one of the most technically gifted goalkeeper coaches you could want to work with for any young goalies that are working with so you see he's working with Villa at the moment Emmy Martinez who has just gone on from being a good goalkeeper to the next level yeah, at the yeah. minute do you know what I mean he's probably one of the best goalkeepers up there in the top 10 in the world at the minute and what about the at that time like the kind of boys club and the drinking culture and like I said there was a couple of players on that list that, that kind of uh, fit the bill so was it a kind of thing or were you a bit young and yeah like I was, I was still thing? too young for that like I say I was um, it was just we, we had such a young like a, a young talent a young pool of like talented players like I say the likes of me Carl Emery Chris Commons we didn't really get into that drinking side of it we were too young we were like yeah. 18, 19, 20 so it was just sort of more going and playing snooker and frigging yeah. do you know yeah. what I mean casino it's, that kind of stuff Addy Akinbae there yeah, <laughs> yeah Addy Akinbae big shout out to Addy what a guy by the way honestly Addy Akinbae wow he was I think he was probably one of the first people who 
like took me under his wing. He used to he used to always come up to me and be like, Fozzy, you've got a bit, you know, you could genuinely go and do a bit in this football game. Um, don't settle for just not playing or just kicking about as third choice at Stoke City. Do you know what I mean? He was like, go and knock on the manager's door, go and tell him you want to go out on loan, go and play, all that kind of stuff. Um, and he was really, he was massive for me. He really looked after me. And it was he was a guy that made me go and say, I want to go out on loan and but start playing. But you remember that 20 years later, you remember that and... I know that you will have that those conversations with the young lads at, at Watford now and previous clubs. How important is it to have players like that around? Because they talk about it when Jordan Henderson was in the England squad and they were saying he hasn't played and people, were, you know, that Roy Keane thing with he's a cheerleader, what's he doing? Is he doing card mm-hmm. tricks? How important? Is it to have those players around? It's, it's honestly, it's so important. Like, it's, uh, when I was younger, people always used to say about play, experienced players and players with experience, and I used to think, no, like experience isn't a thing. It's about talent. It's about what you've got. It's about what you can do right now. Talent. That's all that matters. It's not, honestly. Like, I know I'm an older player now, but experience is so important, ridiculously yeah. important. It is. But with experience comes judgment. And for a goalkeeper, that's incredibly important because, you know, you are centre mid, you give a loose pass away or make the wrong decision. You can get away with it a lot of the time. Goalkeeper, it's a goal. So when you were at that age, you got farmed out on loan a lot, um, which was really good, you know, for you. It was incredible. Honestly, for me, when I was younger, all I wanted to do was go and play first team football. I've always said it all the way through my career. Training is nice and that's where you can learn the basics to an extent, but it's getting out on loan. It's playing. Like I used to, I've been out on loan to so many teams, Um, Stratford, um, sorry, Stafford Rangers, Tiverton Town, Wrexham, Mm. Kidderminster Harriers and that you all learn different things from them. You go into a different change room with a different dynamic of yeah. players and different group of people. And you need to learn how to get on with those people and how relationships work and what their style of play might be. They, another team might have a different style of play. I'm playing at Tiverton Town where there might be a hundred fans in the stadium and you can hear every single one of them slating you and killing you and yeah, abusing yeah. you. But it's awesome. All Everything is just another facet to your game that but you're learning. But you're picking up things everywhere you go, everywhere, right? Everywhere, yeah. And, and dropping things as well. So For you're sure, seeing literally. Yeah. You're, you're thinking yeah. <laughs> but you, you know you're seeing things that might not work for your game uh, certain things that managers might do that you don't enjoy or and then you you go to another club and they do it in a totally different way and you think you know that's good that's not good I take that I won't take that for sure and- I, that, so this, when, you, when you said earlier about what how you can pass it on to the younger players and I always just try and say to the younger players like learn who you are not only within football but out of football just be comfortable with who you yeah. are as a person and once you can do that that's when you can start to learn what your limitations and capabilities are as a footballer and as long as you operate in between them two, you won't get found out because if you're honest with yourself and you say, I can't do that and I can do that, stay in between there, boom, you can smash it mm-hmm. from there, honestly. And it's interesting because someone like Harry Kane had a lot of loan spells. Yeah, he did. A lot of loan spells. A lot, a, lot of play- a lot of people have said about him as well that when he was younger, like when he went out on loan to Preston, Leicester, all those kind, they could not see him becoming the player that yeah. he is. They, they genuinely didn't think he would have anywhere near the career, career that he's it, got at the minute. But that's about different people developing sure, at different times. At different but times. also, I heard a comment about Harry Kane last week, which I thought was really interesting because you don't often hear comments quite like this. And they said, he is the most streetwise footballer in the Premier League. Yeah. And you look at how he uses his body and everything else and you think, playing in these leagues with... He's coming up against big, horrible defenders and it's maybe a little bit more um, volatile, I guess, and the referees and aren't quite on top of you. Um, it's going to stand him in good stead, he's isn't it? He's so clever. The guy is a he's a joke. He's, he's for me, one, like, yeah. don't get me wrong, there's three or four, but he's one of the best strikers yeah. in the world. He's So at the minute, the, he's obviously been linked with the likes of Man City. If he gets the move to Man City... <laughs> Game over. It's guaranteed. Monopoly. As long as he stays fit, which he should do, he, you know, I mean, he gets some ankle injuries here and there, but he's guaranteed to score goals. It's, yeah. He does what it says on the tin. It's literally as simple as that. They're buying themselves a thirty-goal a season striker, yeah, yeah. and he guarantee, will almost as a guarantee. As a guarantee. Yeah, yeah. So for me, I'd say, if I'm Man City and you've got, you can spend hundred million on him or hundred and thirty million on Kane. Just go and get Kane because you know for a fact he's going to do it. It's as simple. He's so clever. You saw, you saw in the Euros there the amount of times where he would drop a little bit deeper into sort of that into the midfield almost or even a little bit more and he would get hold of the ball and he was able to 
put his head on a swivel and he would know exactly where other players are around him. He would know where to turn his body so the opposition can't get it off him. He was buying fouls right, left and centre. And then when he gets the ball into his feet, he's in dangerous positions. He doesn't need any back lift to be able to just smack it in the goal. Yeah. He's an animal, he's, honestly. He's yeah. class. He's class. And nearly bought it home, didn't he? But exactly. There yeah. you go. Exactly. Going back to the career then. So Stoke, just rattled. We were not going to go through each loan because you had a few. So you touched on a couple there. So what what were your loans? So yeah, like I say, um, I went first, very first loan I did was Bristol City. I went as backup keeper there, number two. Which Steve I, Phillips? Steve Phillips was the goalkeeper. Thoroughly enjoyed it, honestly. It's great to be, be part of the first team, see how it worked on a match day, all that kind of stuff. Um, I was only there for a month, but honestly, I absolutely loved it. Great, great football club, Bristol City as well. And then, Back from there, went out on loan to Kidderminster for the end of the season. Only played a couple games because um, one of the goalkeepers got injured at Stoke and I had to be recorded. And it, again, it was great. I, we're training on park pitches. You know, you're playing on a Saturday afternoon and in front of a, a probably a couple thousand fans, which was, again, was wicked. It was a massive yeah. step for me. Just playing in front of a couple thousand fans, you'd really sort of like the pressure's on almost. Um, so, yeah, two games there, then got back. And then the best, the best loan for me really was Wrexham that was where it all but started Tiverton was in obviously, between yeah we had a few in between I had a few in between Tiverton Town I was there for a couple of months brilliant went on holiday to Mallorca with them in the summer Bludger <laughs> go on Bludger There's a few lads like the manager Martin Rogers he's been there since day one he's, he's managed over a thousand games wow That's outrageous um, a real sort of family orientated tight knit yeah. club like the the guys at the time were so they were just such a wicked bunch of lads like I said we went to Mallorca on holiday had a wicked time <laughs> Magaluf all that kind of stuff when I'm young it was that one's for another day yeah no I'm wicked one of the lads right one of the lads was a sicko right bludger his name was a big tall like centre back six foot five six foot six big youth he was like an oaf kind of thing but lovely bloke he was an animal if you got a, a few beers down him right sicko and there was this one time right there was and it's not even funny because I think he got arrested at the time but it was like <laughs> a go. barman was carrying a tray of drinks or something like that and he's walking to take him to whatever and he's just gone up and two footed him he's gone and two footed him on the friggin there in the middle of everybody unlike the dance floor drinks flying everywhere kind of thing police got called I think he ended up in the cells for a day or two he's an animal Jesus. mate lovely bloke apart Brilliant. from that he's a lovely, lovely bloke, bloke. So, so apart you, from two fighting people guy. so you mentioned it when it really kicked into life was Wrexham and this is what started a real intricate series of events that really pushed on your career yeah, so th th this is the bits and bobs about football that people don't really see so much. So I'm on loan at Wrexham and I'm doing really well at Wrexham. League? Um, like league two they league were League two, so yeah. like the old fourth division Maybe type. Maybe league one, league two, yeah, I'm not yeah. sure. We, it was when we won the Aldi V Vans trophy. But I was doing really well at Wrexham. Um, obviously, the this is where I got the move to Man United because Dar Darren Ferguson was there, who's obviously the son of Alex Ferguson. And he said to me at the end of the season, you know, what's happening next year with you at Stoke? And I only had a year left at Stoke. And I said, I don't know, really, to be honest with you. I, you know, I just want to go and play football. I'm not going to play at Stoke. Um, and he said, well, listen, don't do anything silly. Don't sign any new contracts or anything like that, because I'm pretty sure my dad wants to sign you for Man United. And I'm like, wow, this is <laughs> this is outrageous. This is this yeah. is beyond. Like He's like, don't tell anybody. Keep it quiet. But I, I, I know for a fact I was straight on the blower, sort of telling everybody, <laughs> ringing you guys. Oh, my God, listen to this, listen to this. It was crazy. But so... I finished the season at Wrexham, did really well. And I'm still on two, I think I was on 350 quid at a week At this point, you have not played a first team game for Stoke? No, still, so still. You, and, and Man United. I've been there three or four years, three years maybe. Incredible. And they've just loaned me out and I haven't played any games for Stoke. Yeah. And I'm on 350 pound a week at this time, yeah. And then obviously Stoke get wind that some of the big boys are looking at me. I've done really well. And they were like, we want to offer you a new contract. Uh, you know, we want to we want to, we want want to, to tie you down to a three or four year deal. And uh, I think, uh, come on. <laughs> like, obviously I'm not going to sign it. I know I'm not going to play here, but you know what I mean? I, it's going to make it so much easier for me to move to another team if I've only got a year left on my deal. Do you know what I mean? So I rejected everything. I remember getting brought into the manager's office and then you had the chief executive there at the same time saying, you should do it. It's a really good deal. And I didn't have an agent at the time or anything. And they're pulling me in saying, sign this, sign this basically. And I'm like, uh, like crapping myself. It's horrible. And like, you didn't have an agent? No, I didn't have an agent at the time. At and, all? No. And the pressure they put in on you is... Phenomenal! Like you, bet, are, yeah. I'm crapping myself. And honestly. this, and this is on a wing and a prayer from Darren Ferguson saying, "Exactly, my dad's interested." They, they got wind of it. They knew. They knew that because I'd done so well that there were other teams looking at me for sure. Is it um, like that now? Would they still like pressure players? There's still, there's still a lot of that goes on in football where really? they will pressure the younger players. Wow. Yeah, they will get them in without the agent being there, and they will tell them this, tell try them that, do, do that, this, do that, and, and then, they'll yeah. try and do it underhand. And it's a bit sneaky, really, to be yeah, fair. Yeah, that's you, not on. It's it? not on at all. No, it's not. The shop window, though, was 
the LDV Vans final. So yeah. Sir Alex Ferguson went to watch Wrexham, his lads managing. So he personally scouted you. He per Yeah, it was really good. It was awesome, to be fair, because after that game, there were probably about six games left of the season. And like I say, Darren Ferguson pulled me aside probably, I think it was a week or two after that final. And he said, you know, don't do anything silly in the summer, but my dad's watching you for Man United and I've still got four or five games left to play of the season. So every game I'm going into it thinking, <laughs> oh, don't mess up, please don't mess up. And I know for a fact that he came to a couple of the games, Alex Ferguson did, he's there with Tony Cote and the goalie coach and they're watching me and I can see them watching me and I'm thinking, shit, do not mess up, please. Jeez. But we got through it anyway. And like I say, it all materialised and thankfully I did. I managed to get the move to Man United. And when you signed for Man United, I'll put my little spin on it first yeah. because I was at a barbecue at my mum's house and you rang me, you'll have rang your family and a couple of mates and you rang me and said, I've signed for Man United. And it was like a four-year contract. And I was like, this was Man United in, in the pomp. their heyday. Yeah, the pomp. And yeah. I like was like, get the fuck out seriously and you're like yeah yeah and i remember like putting the phone down and obviously my parents knew you know you really well and everything and i was like ben's just signed for man united <laughs> <laughs> can i tell you a funny story quickly as well we had um so like i said i, I said kyle Henry used, he got me into gambling massively when i was younger <laughs> and um i remember this one occasion it was incredible right we were playing darts in the changing rooms we had a dartboard in the changing yeah. rooms at stuff and we were playing for money and carl henry was a mug all right he was so easy <laughs> to take money from i used to beat him at snooker darts i'm a sport billy so I'm, I'm decent at most sports yeah and i would just play him at darts and i would like i'd hustle him a little bit and i'd be like oh come on let's play for a bit of money then so i remember i was about 800 quid up on him playing darts yeah I was, it was awesome i'm thinking 800 quid i'm on like 350 quid a week here at stoke and i'm 800 <laughs> quid up at darts it's a amazing and then i knew obviously about main night but i was keeping it quiet and then one of the lads came in right and he went fuzzy it's on the news man united are trying to buy you and i kind of just like went i think i went bright red and i was like oh uh, yeah yeah and kyle emery is literally like mid dart throw gone are you going to man you and i've gone I, I don't know i don't know and he went if you go man you will you let me off the money <laughs> <laughs> and i was like not a chance I mate like, i was like I, tell, I said carl if i go to man united i'll let you off the money it's not a problem mate all right and he went all right sweet so we carried on anyway regardless <laughs> like um but yeah i did i let him off the money as well he texted me the other day actually and don't know how we got onto it but it, we i texted him about it saying i'm sure you still owe me 800 quid from that darts match you used to play on the thing but um that is funny mate it's funny as well. right let's look at your first day at man united because you had a little incident uh not an incident just, just before that just i just want to touch on the point of like you you went from 350 pound right yeah to uh united signing you what was that moment like of of the actual you know, signing the contract and seeing the, the figures on the and, thing and you know moving to United right so that I'll, must have um, just been so when, when I signed for Man insane, United right? I'll tell you what I earned when I, when I signed for Man United okay? yeah, so yeah, bearing yeah. in mind I was still fairly young I think they signed me for about a million quid so and I were was, you going in as number three no, I was like four, three or four or something like you that were yeah. the, so at the time when you signed Van der Sar Kushak had just signed Kushak Luke Steele I think they were just about to sign Kushak yeah Luke Steele was there Tom Heaton was there wow um, there were quite a few goalies to be fair Tim Howard was still there actually um, there was quite a few goalies so but it, I knew I wasn't going to be around the team for a while I knew I was going to go straight out on loan and that's cool I, I was buzzing to just go out on loan and play some football but um, I remember signing the contract and seeing how much at this point I've obviously got an agent because as soon as you get yeah, linked yeah, with someone like Man United you've got agents right left your phone goes hot yeah yeah exactly yeah <laughs> A hot property so like every agent wants to know um so anyway i had an agent at this point you know the contract's in front of me and i can see the signing on fee and the weekly wage it's all there in front of me and the the signing on fee was 60 grand yeah like oh my god like so they're gonna put just 60 grand just straight into my account i was like wow this is outrageous money life changer money kind of thing and the weekly wage i was on five grand a week so bear in mind i'm 22 whatever um and i've gone from 350 quid a week onto five thousand yeah, yeah. pound a week in my first year at man united it was honestly like life-changing money but i remember i remember when the money actually hit that when that signing on fee actually hit into my bank account they actually they send a letter with it as well so a letter got sent to the house from hsbc and literally the next day the HSBC like branch managers ring me up going hi Mr Foster listen we'd love yeah. to we'd love to just get you down we'd love to upgrade your account to a premier account and yeah, all this yeah. kind of stuff and um, but yeah that's the way the world works as soon as you have a little bit of money or something like that just everybody wants to know about it it's crazy isn't it mad mad interesting interesting so life changing life changing it is it is and then at United you got brought back down to earth 
a little bit because there was an interesting story you told me recently with Rio. <laughs> Rio, yeah. Um, so I, I was only, I was only at the club for about probably a week or two weeks before I was sent straight out on loan to Watford because the the season was sort of going to be starting in the next week or two. Um, so I was only there for a little bit, just did a bit of training with them, got to meet a few of the lads, all that kind of stuff. Um, but the very first training session, I, I joined in with the senior players, with the first team. Like bearing in mind, I'm shitting myself at this point. I am shitting it. Like I'm training with the big boys, like Ronaldo, Scolzi, Giggsy, Rio, yeah. Rooney, all them bad boys. Um, and we've gone into a six aside and I'm on Rio's team and a few others and Rio's just turned around to me and he's gone um, uh, goalie what's what's your name it's, it's Rob isn't it and I'm oh, <laughs> shit. oh it's horrible mate I, <laughs> no it's Ben it's, yeah it's ben. know your place <laughs> no it's Ben and he went oh yeah Ben, yeah, ben. and I was saying, oh god it's horrible and then it? and then that another straight into another story but you were with like Ronaldo um, I think was it Rooney a little bit later but big boys Rio and Scolzi and Giggsy and everything and, and tell us the little one about how good you knew the players were and the one was Scolzi yeah the Scolzi story is classic because because I, I it was like my first day training with them kind of thing and I'm just watching in awe because like these guys that I'm used to watching on the telly are right in front of me they're metres yeah. away and they were doing like a passing drill into a shooting exercise and um, somebody just zings a ball out I think it was Giggsy zings a ball out to Scolzi on the wing and he does it first time takes it in his stride takes a first time half volley ball straight out over to the other side and I'm just I, I must have involuntarily just gone wow <laughs> oh my God. Like, and T Tony Coton's, because we're still doing the goalkeeper training at the time, and Tony Coton's next to me, and he's just gone, Who was it, Scolzi? And I've just gone, Yeah, it was. And he, he's just cut and looked at me and gone, Yeah, mate, that's that's just how it that's is. It. That's how it is. And that's why, like, all the Get big boys, all the, all, the, all, the, all the legends of the game, the Xavi, the Iniestas, Messi's, all them kind of guys, always say that Scolzi's one of the best players they've ever played yeah. against or love to watch the most. And the same for all the Man United lads, always used to say the same thing. Scolzi's the best player. And he was, he just, he was so effortless for him yeah what Pure a talent. player what, what a, a player, player. Talent. Yeah. so you loan then so obviously at United straight out to Watford in the championship you weren't amongst the favourites to get promoted were we you we were favourites to get relegated that season yeah we were favourites to get relegated and because they had just escaped um, like on the last day of the season the season before they had just escaped relegation basically manager uh, Aidy Boothroyd and um, yeah we, we went into that season favourites to get relegated but AD Bo I've got to say AD Boothroyd what a guy like wicked shout out to AD Boothroyd brilliant bloke brilliant man manager he found a style of play that suited us so well we, we were basically just a bunch of big lads and he was like right get the ball forward as quickly as you could you had a massive team massive team Darius Henderson up front honestly what an animal big big sort of bat rim ram he would just knock it down for Marlon King and Ashley Young and they would just go and score all the time it was incredible so, so you had some good players didn't you, you yeah Marlon King yeah. Darius Henderson, yeah. Ashley Young, Ashley Young got a big Clark move Carlyle. the season after a couple of years after. Yeah, Gavin Ma, Jay James Demerit, Chambers, Jay Demerit, James Chambers, Malky yeah. Mackay, Hammer Bawatsa, Hammer Bawatsa, a hula hoop. <laughs> <laughs> so monster munch, not hula. His feet were like monster munches, honestly. <laughs> they were all like, they're horrible feet. Um, he had a hammer of a left foot though, honestly. Um, but yeah, like I said, the, the first season, again, it was just me getting used to playing really competitive yeah. first team football in front of 15, 20, 30,000 people every week and it was a massive learning curve and it took me a while. Honestly, it took me a while at first to get used to it because I wasn't, I wasn't used to being a first team goalkeeper and being relied on and mm. people looking up to me and needing me to do a job every single week reliably um, I was still sort of I lived just around the corner but I was still late every day um, the reason why I had to literally book my ideas up was because I had been late for a match day once we were playing at home to Leeds and it was on the telly it was a five o'clock kickoff or something I thought it was a seven o'clock kickoff oh. and I've turned up to the stadium and I've seen fans literally like loads of fans I'm thinking what on earth why is there so many fans here my phone is on the t for seat next to me I've looked at it missed calls for fun oh my god oh, I man. must have had 20 missed calls oh the panic mate the panic just went oh no quickly looked at it the manager's rung everybody all the players have rung what on earth oh, quickly oh, I'm coming I'll be, I'll be there I'm one minute I'm one minute wait mate and what happens in a situation like that what were the repercussions? So yeah. he he find me a grand. He find me a one thousand pound. Got being off there, didn't you? Got off super light, super light. And but the worst part of it wasn't the fine. It wasn't that. It was the fact that he said Eddie Boothroyd said right. 
you are so sloppy. You are ridiculously sloppy. You need to learn from this. So he says, I'm going to write a letter to Sir Alex Ferguson and I'm going to tell him exactly how sloppy you are. And I was like, okay. <laughs> okay. Wow, you, you do horrible. not want that. Oh, it was horrible. Did he, did he write yeah, the letter? Oh, he wrote the letter. He, wrote, he showed me the letter and he wrote it and he basically graded Fergie all of my up. games to that point. He had graded all my games and he said, he did this wrong, he did that wrong. He's late for training. He's doing this. He's sloppy all over the shot. The next international break, which was like a month into the season or something like that, I was back up at Carrington doing a bit of training with Man United. The first day I got back in, Man United, Alex Ferguson, straight in his office. Wow. The first taste of the hairdryer. You got roasted. Really roasted. So. Absolutely nailed. What did and he I say? sat there. He, he, he just nailed me. Spend for it. Nailed me. You don't do that. You're a Man United player. Yeah, yeah. You do not do that. That At the time at Man United, you didn't do that. Because you're representing them as well when you go exactly. out. Exactly. So. Of course you are, yeah. yeah. You you hadn't been through an academy. You hadn't. You kind of were thrown in. Not an excuse. Yeah, Not sure. an excuse. Yeah. But I think it's fair to say the professionalism came at Watford and you I had, just didn't know what it was I didn't know what it was and you had a you, the other goal Alec Chamberlain was a real mentor of yours yeah he was he? yeah for sure he was it was absolutely class so yeah that was a massive turning point for me at that point we were probably like I say only a month into the season so I'd only played three or four games but that was a massive turning point for me and Alec, like I say Alec Chamberlain really took me under his wing sort of showed me the ropes I made sure from that moment on I was never late again I was there yeah. I was there I was training hard doing all the things properly um, and that's when Coincidentally, my form started to pick up as well. So I was doing better in games, finished the season really strong. The team got promoted. Um, it was a fantastic season. We did it through the playoffs as well. The playoffs, if you can guarantee one way to get promoted from the Championship, League One, League Two, it's to do it through the playoffs. So that yeah. was... It's a roller coaster, but it's, yeah, yeah, if yeah. you can win it, oh... Cardiff? Cardiff, yeah, Millennium so Stadium, yeah. we had a... Co I remember, again, I remember it was like playoff and I was down playing squash and you rang and go, doing a coach. Yeah, doing a coach, we, we all your coach friends, on, yeah. all your family, put a coach on. Oh, what a day out! What a day! Out. Beat Leeds three nil. Yeah, um, incredible day out. Like your whole family, all your friends, like everyone from Leamington that you know, like on yeah. this big coach. And we just had an outrageous day out on the last. Just got on it. Brilliant, on the lash. brilliant, just, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, proper. We we were the same. Had a, it was wicked because, like I said, we've just been promoted. We've been the big time. We're in the Premier League. I'm still only on loan, but I'm thinking, please, I've got to come back here next season. Mm -hmm. But I have to come back on loan next season. As a fan and like as your mate, uh, that was my favourite year of your career. Yeah. Because we were at an age where none of us had kids. Um and me, your brothers, your sister, like Rust and like Luke and, and all the mates and stuff. We yeah. we went home and away I would say we 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 did it. We did nearly every game. At least Ipswich away, yeah. Norwich all away, the, yeah, all of that, and yeah. like we'd go and there'd be like eight, ten of us every week. Uh, what a what a brilliant Fast, brilliant year! I and I remember actually probably the Watford thing. It was your first few games. So what the story you've just told rings true, because at Watford. After the games, in the first few games, you'd meet us in the pub at the end of the road for a pint. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> which is I would literally, which is absolutely the top, outrageous. There's a pub at the top of Vicarage Road, and I would literally meet you all in there. And like, it got to a point though, eventually, that people knew I was going to be coming in there, so I was just getting mobbed, and I was like, "Dad, I can't yeah. keep coming in, all right? I, I, I'm just getting trouble. I'm going to get in trouble, kind of thing. Especially if you have a bad game, you're just going to get abused and stuff." So, um, no, it was it was absolutely wicked. But like I said, that we got promoted, and then. For me, I, it was so important that I just spent the next year on loan with Watford, which thankfully happened as well. So yeah. um, spent the next season on loan at Watford. And even though we got relegated, I learned so much. That second season in the Premier League, especially, it was just the biggest learning curve for me. I, I knew for a fact I was going to be busy week in, week out. I knew I'd have saves to make. I knew I'd be always under under the microscope in action I was playing for Man United but out on loan at Watford but no I, I thoroughly enjoyed myself and I do honestly believe that is the biggest season in my career for me yeah um, like even with Watford though like you did I remember like you did professionalise massively but yeah. we still had some fun down in Watford didn't we like some nights out down for there sure, yeah. and um Who's either got Richard Lee was uh, Richard Lee was there. Oh, we had a good school, the lads. To be fair, the lads loved getting on it. It was wicked. Uh, he's what <laughs> every finger in every pie going. Richard Lee. Yeah, the businessman. The business. The businessman. Yeah. Been on Dragons Den, all that. Do you remember that? Brilliant. Yeah, Den, yeah, yeah, yeah. He actually got it. It was for the cap company, New Era Caps and stuff like that. And he was um, he sold it to Bannatine, I think it was. Wow. 
Yeah, I don't think it actually went through though. To be fair, no, I don't want to talk about it. That's a different. Yeah, but that was <laughs> interesting because I remember like you'd uh, like Richard come back to Lamington and have nights out with with us lot. Yeah, and uh, I always remember because it was like the goalkeepers would always play the game of. Do you remember there was a sign in Lamington of yeah. who could jump the highest? Because Richard Lee always backs himself as he's not the but tallest Richard goalkeeper Lee's only about in the world. Five foot ten, isn't yeah, but he five says I'm nine. not the tallest goalkeeper in the world, but I can jump the highest. Right, so I remember you and Richard Lee, and there were like these signs that were like honestly so far off the ground and you two were like trying to get your fingertips and then you had like people like Oldsy and Wes trying to hit them yeah, like non-footballers yeah. big slugs of men like <laughs> yeah. weighing about, freaking, about three uh, foot, 20 kilos about three foot lower than you and Rich Lee <laughs> right, it's class. great yeah, times though we weren't they great times mate we had some great times that's when like you're young and free and like you ain't got kids and it's just nice you know what I mean it's yeah I think you, as you get older you learn to slow it down a little bit yeah you? and then you were back to Man United back to Man United yeah so um um, straight away the next season I, I'd done my cruciate at the end of the season so that next season was basically a pretty much a write-off um, I remember I played two two games towards the end of the season because all the goalies got injured um, I made my debut it was against Derby um, I went I went with yeah, your family you it, yeah. and you had an absolute yeah. blinder yeah good game really good for the first game in like nine months or whatever yeah because um, you got thrown in didn't you yeah it got was... thrown in massively made a couple really good saves I from think, Kenny we, Miller was yeah, it yeah Kenny Miller yeah we ended up winning the game 1-0 I think it was Ronaldo who scored yeah it was Ronaldo has scored ball over to the top and he just put it back across Roy Carroll um, but yeah that was my first taste of playing for Man United and boy was it a different world my Incredible. god it was a different world yeah. like the, the intensity the scrutiny like the microscope wow you were yeah. You, you had to it. you had to be on it like twenty four seven. You had to live Man United. If you're playing for Man United, especially then, you had to live football. You had to live Man United. I tell you what, the moment like even then, is it like a young young man and and watching it, and the moment in my mind that kind of clicked, and you go, these guys are a different breed. They're a different level. Is um, you used to play in the League Cup, didn't you? And you won the League Cup twice yeah. with Man United. And I remember the one year you invited me, Luke, and Andy down. And we got on the train at the platform at Manchester with the club directors. Martin Edwards was there. Bobby Charlton was there. So we've gone down as guests of you. And we're on the pla on the train down. Lovely little bit of champagne and scrambled egg and all this lot. And a couple chavs on the train. <laughs> it big and like they're all posh in that like, yeah. scrambled egg. <laughs> oh, look, it's Fozzie's mates and all that. Bringing the tone right now. Yeah. Well, I did on the way home. And I remember on the way home, like the cups being passed around, but we were on the train on the way home and like that was your f big you know big game for you, yeah, you yeah. we won the cup and we're kind of having a few beers and all this lot but I just remember the tone on the train was it wasn't a celebration yeah the it lads was, weren't allowed to have a beer were we? I was, wasn't allowed to have a beer no I think we, we, were, were, we were dying to go out we went out actually we at went the end out, of well, we went out. didn't we but, but you were, it's not like we could all have a drink on the, on the train it was business as usual it was business it was, as usual it was not a thing yeah we had training tomorrow basically yeah wow. so suck it up like get back, get ready for training tomorrow. But was it? The, it was the it's, league. It's we, that, we did have a night out. Cool, yeah, though, we went it? out in um, in uh, Hale. Hale in suburbia. Because I remember we were on the table next to John O'Shea and his mates because yeah. they missed the train. Yeah, and he paid six hundred quid for them to get a, a cab Uber down, a cab or something. Yeah. yeah, and then we've gone out to the casino and we've given it a right good go in the casino. Nicky Hunt and Ivan Klasnich. We were. <laughs> Do you remember Bolton? <laughs> How random that even Klasnich and Nicky Hunt were on the like on our table. It was mad. It was, yeah, it was mad, isn't it? That, but that's that Man United at that time, like yeah. I, I, I didn't know how to I, like I didn't operate in that world do you know what I mean I, I'm not I'm, I'm professional but I don't live football do you know yeah. what I mean I, I, I love I love playing on a Saturday but I can't live football I can I can sort of train a few times a week and then I live for the weekend and I don't know I buzz off the Saturday afternoon but I can't live it 24-7 for me there's much more important things in life than just football yeah yeah and, and you had a you had a couple of I think a couple of bad games a couple of mistakes and that was it, yeah, really, it was, wasn't it? it? Was, like yeah. when you Sharpish. look at you, but you look since at like people like David De Gea and the chances, and you know he's not had the best year or two compared to previous years because he set the bar so yeah. high. But I, as you may, not exactly impartial, but I look <laughs> back and think you were bombed out 
Af- I think, quite quick. I, 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 yeah, I know what you're saying, but I think I think they could just see that I wasn't cut out for it at that yeah, moment okay. in time. Do you know what I mean? I could. I think they could just see that, and um, I, I fully, I still fully think it's the right decision for me to move on. I remember Alex Ferguson pulling me into his office and saying, "Ben, listen, we've had an offer for you from Birmingham City. We 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 as a club think it's a really good opportunity for you. What do you think? What you what are your thoughts on it?" And I remember straight away saying, "Yeah." incredible thank you I, I I just think I need to go and they knew that as well they knew I needed to go was it a go. relief for you oh for sure like like I say the microscope of it you can't move if you're a Man United player and you go out up north somewhere you can't move people yeah. know who you are and you're getting pictured I, I guarantee it'll be worse now like you would not be able to go out because with camera phones and all that kind of stuff they would be literally videoing you 24-7 people will have everything that you've done on that night out documented somewhere so that for me like I, I couldn't enjoy that I can't enjoy even like like now like we we get quite a bit with cycling gk and their people are brilliant aren't they but they are full on still kind of thing they will want they yeah. want a video and all that kind of stuff like, which is understandable because i think you but youtube's a different world isn't it where like people feel a bit more of a connection with you yeah whereas with footballers they're like it's like they're looking to try and stitch you up or catch a yeah, bit of footage that. of somebody doing but, something well that's they the difference be doing. when youtube has this like personal feel to it for, for sure and you're giving out your personality every day so yeah. the people that watch you they know you. They're, it's like they, they, they know. They, they know exactly. You. They know but me, in, and I, I quite like that. So yeah. they come up to me, and they're they're more personal. They can have a chat to you. They can have a chat to me about something. And I'm like, oh, but I understand. Wicked. I understand yeah. it because when I look at these huge footballers, I just don't get their lives. I don't know what they do. Yeah, for sure. As soon as that whistle's blown, that's it. That's yeah. the last I hear. I think it's because they're so scared to show what they do in case somebody yeah. has an opinion about it or they think that's not right you shouldn't be doing that you shouldn't be here now you've got a game in two days do you know what I mean you should be recovering you should live your life just revolving around football but again that's not me I I wasn't able to do that that moment in time and in my life I couldn't I couldn't live football 24-7 so the opportunity to leave came and I did I was so relieved for it the the pressure off my shoulders at that time so oh finally I can breathe again kind of thing and you're a bit of a home bird yeah for sure you you know Birmingham living living locally again exactly yeah um yeah and then again it was <laughs> there's some nice little stories that you just pop in your mind and, about. and i remember it was like when you signed for birmingham the phone calls come out yeah. and i remember you ring me and luke and go sign for birmingham it's now the thursday what are you doing on sunday and i'm <laughs> like ah oh, nothing I'm going to work on monday we're going to Vegas. <laughs> me, you and Luke, we're going to Vegas. It's on me. I've signed for Blues. Let's just go and have a bit of fun Boom. and everything. What a trip. But it was lovely though because like I said, when you play for them sort of teams, like the focus isn't on you so much kind of thing. You're not a Man United player anymore. Just all, also, It doesn't matter if, if somebody in a place hears that there's a Man United player there that's it like it's like oh my god where is he everybody needs to find out and everybody needs to know but when you're just a footballer like you can just go about your business and yeah, have a yeah. nice time and we did didn't we we just went to Vegas had a lovely time well the like, thing is about Vegas people is, aren't watching and stuff it's wicked I think one person recognised you in Vegas in four days yeah. and that was Adam Chambers from Watford was it yeah. Adam Chambers yeah Adam Chambers Adam Chambers uh, yeah, from Watford yeah. who's there with Luke his brother Chambers, Luke, Chambers. Luke Chambers but they, yeah. they, were, they were there Chambers together brother. Yeah. and it was like okay and Matt. it's really nice isn't it yeah it's lovely it was it was lovely good but, job because that was a bit of a trip that was it was <laughs> wicked really session Bill but um, <laughs> I remember getting on the plane I just signed for Blues and do you remember they, they had the four big blue noses in, on the seats in front of us and they were like oh you've just signed brilliant nice to meet you nice to meet you no you know we've had Joe Art last season like all the best like following on from that I was like cheers lads thanks yeah. a lot yeah. well Blues Blues next season was you were there for one season yeah only one season and, Blues, but, yeah. but what a contrasting season that was yeah for sure it's it was it was um do you know what i loved it i absolutely loved it i know we got relegated and great club great club massive club honestly they've got a chance that they should be a lot bigger than what they are i think obviously the owners and stuff like that it's a different story for a different time but they're they're a, they're a sleeping giant they really are and that season for me was absolutely amazing I was back home I was living my best life I was literally playing football with a bunch of lads that I love playing football with like I say we got relegated it, we shouldn't have got relegated our team was way too good to get relegated but it happened but in the, on the journey there we did go and win the, the League Cup um, and that for me is still my that's my biggest moment in football I've played for yeah. my country I've made my England debut I've played against Spain, Brazil, France doesn't matter that one moment when that full time whistle goes when we win the League Cup against Arsenal at Wembley for Birmingham City the first time that they've won a trophy in God knows how long um, oh wow it just it, it gives me goosebumps even That's now just one. thinking about That's it now one. gives me goosebumps when you now. talk about clubs being too good to go down and 
Didn't Wigan win the FA Cup and yeah. get relegated? Yeah. Because when you won the League Cup, because the Cup finals quite early in yeah, the football like, season. Yeah, uh, march You March-ish went on a isn't it? horrible Rotten run, run, didn't you? Where everybody was so emotionally drained, honestly. they were, it just It's like that final had taken so much out of all of us. And look and at the players. Carry on. Look at the players. Oh, you mate, had yeah. Lee Bowyer, yeah. Barry Ferguson, yeah. Scott, Scott Dan, Roger Johnson. Scott Dan, Roger Johnson. Back, Stephen yeah. Carr. Seb Larson. Obafemi Martin. Obafemi Seb Martin. Martin. You had a... Property. Very good team. Really, really good and then, team. And then the young lad, Jack Butlin was there, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, Jack Butlin was there. And then yeah. Big Mike Taylor is yeah. number two. Big Mike Taylor is number two. Um, yeah, um, Jack Butland, I remember him. He was only an 18-year-old kid at the time, but he was already six foot four. He was like a bloke anyway. He was v- really mature. You could just see he was going to go and have a I remember you, I remember you saying when you were at every day, wasn't I? Saying, he, what he's a, a player. What he's a, a goalie. Player. He's going to be a monster. I remember saying to, you say it to him all the time, mate, you're going to be some goalie, you. You're gonna, <laughs> you can just tell. Like yeah. the ones When you see these certain types of young players, you can just tell. Because yeah. it's not necessarily just their ability and their skill, their technical, this, that, whatever. It's what they've got in between their heads and you can see it with certain players little moves they make on the pitch little preempting stuff yeah, yeah. do you know what I mean they're pointing where they want the ball they're talking they're shouting they're telling players they're 18, 19 years old and they're doing that that for me is the biggest indicator yeah. of whether they're going to be a player or not yeah and I think because obviously then you moved on to West Brom really sad seeing them go down guys before we talk about West Brom can I just do a big shout out to Miles a football manager for the official football manager kit look at this beauty sponsored by TikTok we have got War Child the main sponsor on the middle of the shirt how awesome is this this is an absolutely beautiful kit by the way so big shout out to Miles War Child is a charity set up for uh, children who are displaced uh, through war so big shout out to them guys absolutely smashing it absolutely love, love it. the shirt as well it's about to isn't it come on yeah it's lovely that is mate right West Brom come on give it to me West, West Brom. Brom West Brom so this is this is like your long term home in my football. club this is my club yeah. so this is the club that I have spent the majority of my career at um, we had seven or was it seven or eight I'm not really sure but seven or eight years of Premier League football absolutely the the best years of my life as a footballer the the kids grow grew up to be West Brom fans I will always be a West Brom fan um no I can only ever ever say really really good things about West Brom the uh the people that I met along the way were literally friends for life you know people like Boaz Myhill will be my friend for life like some of the guys I got to play with some seriously incredible players Romelu Lukaku people like that um and uh, you ask Romelu the same you ask him about West Brom he'll only tell you good things honestly and so when you talk about Boaz I've had the privilege of meeting him recently absolutely top top bloke another goalkeeper obviously so this goalkeepers union we hear lots and lots about this is a thing right monster thing mate absolutely proper thing I one thing I've learned in my 20 years of playing football is you very very rarely come across a dickhead goalkeeper you very rarely do I know one who <laughs> <laughs> honestly it's goalies are goalies are the the normal people in the changing rooms we're like the glue we're normally quite level headed guys the level headed guys the calm guys if we do something good we don't shout and scream about it we just go about our business understated under the you know what i mean under the radar all that kind of stuff we genuinely are those types of guys we all we all seem to really get on well like I say the goalkeepers union it's like because we spend so much more time together when we go out to training we will go out the three four goalkeepers we'll go out together we'll all sit next to each other anyway but then we go out together we'll spend 35 40 minutes together just catching balls and you know what yeah. i mean booting balls at each other all that kind of stuff you just learn this sort of camaraderie camaraderie and like real bond between the goalkeepers and I've, like i say I've, I've i honestly don't think i could name you any goalkeepers I've come across that have been whoppers. But this this is the thing, because a lot of football fans might think, but they're in competition with each other. And even like with last season, you got injured and Dan Backman came in and, and Dan did really well at the Euros, did really well last season. I think people struggle to wrap their head around that, no, it's not, a f- it, yes, people want to be the number one, 
but you like Dan, you like Pontus at Watford and, and Rob Elliot. young lad Rob Elliot yeah. and Adam Park. Adam Park. You all get on great. For sure, because for me personally, I because I've been there and done it and seen it, I know the pressures and how hard it is to be a, fo- a first team goalkeeper, to play week in, week out and keep your level at a high level. I know yeah. how hard it is. It's very difficult. So when there's somebody ahead of me doing it in my place, for example, like last season, Dan Batman, he's playing week in, week out. The guy just took to it like a duck to water. Honestly, he was absolutely brilliant. It's like he... he I think he had one loan out on uh, to Kilmarnock. Kilmarnock, it was se- yeah. The season or the season before that, maybe he did. He did well there. Don't get me wrong, but to come straight in halfway through a season and just play flawlessly for the whole season, yeah, he did honestly, well. it he takes did some well. doing. You know, yeah. it really does. But I can appreciate how hard that is for somebody to come in and to do that. So I have to sit back and I have to admire that. I have to be. Uh, my role there changes from being the goalkeeper to getting behind him. I have to get behind him. I have to give him little tips, tricks, advice, help him when he needs it and just show him the way that I've learned how to do it myself kind of thing. And like I say, as an, old, an older goalkeeper, even an older player, you just learn to do that to players. And then even last season, you've had Rob Elliott come in from Newcastle. What a um, bloke, wicked bloke. Well, like, again, he's what number three yeah. and Rob will know the lay of the land. For sure. But as... As a player, I remember when he signed and after a week or two and you're like, oh, it's brilliant to have Rob around. What a guy. Yeah. And again, it's what people always forget is it's a work environment. Yeah, and yes, sure. it's brilliant. Yes, it's great. And a lot of players are very, very well paid. I get all that. But you are going to work and to work with good people. Do you know what it is? It's these players, they don't have any value. Okay. They're not valuable players. They're not worth anything. You can't sell them. Okay. They're not assets. What they are, though, is invaluable to the team around the place their worth to the team is invaluable they are like like rob is like me he's like he's like the glue of the dressing room he doesn't shut up talking but you need people like that you know you have to have these guys that are going lads i'm sweating my tits off today and then it starts a conversation instead of because nowadays young lads just sit on the phone <laughs> I'm not even joking right they just sit there on the phone scrolling mate how old are oh, you just, mate, how old are I you I swear in my life right they just scroll that's all they do and I'm walking in going get off your fucking phones yeah <laughs> like talk please I would, I would have thought that would have been banned from nah because it's the kids nowadays they are brought up on their phones they yeah, are yeah, yeah. it's like it's like their life is in their yeah. hand they are not going to just give it up okay so it's ne- it will never be banned but they do it in the change and they just sit there on the phone and like Scrolling. the amount of times we've come in me or Rob or some of the older lads and go lads just interact just have a laugh yeah have talk chat, to yeah. people don't just sit there in your own world alright right this is a hell of a tangent here uh, we were on baggies a minute ago I don't, yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't. it's brilliant though yeah. isn't it this is what you want this um, is what you want so baggies yeah you were there you've had talk us through your managers when you were there then um, okay the first manager who signed me was Roy Hodgson the probably one of the best managers I've played for for sure what a guy lovely bloke he gets a bit of a bad rep for his time at Liverpool and for England um, but for me as a bloke he was he's right up there honestly what a just lovely lovely bloke he, if you're if you're doing it properly and playing by the rules and playing by the book he will back you like you wouldn't believe and tell us about the World Cup under Roy Hodgson because you uh, played in the final group stage game when we got knocked out in Brazil. Yeah, so again, for me, that, for me, as a as a sort of checklist of my career, to say that I've played at a World Cup finals is something I never, ever dreamed I'd be able to do. So I will always be indebted yeah. to Roy Hodgson for giving me that opportunity. I remember him telling me, actually, um, we'd obviously lost our first two matches against Italy and Uruguay. And we, we, we'd been knocked out early doors out of the tournament, but we had one more le- match left against Costa Rica. And it was about two days before the game. And he just pulled me to one side in training and said, and I really appreciate everything you've done for us in, in in the tournament. You know, just being around the place, getting behind Joe Hart, who was a goalkeeper. Yeah. Um, just sort of adding to the environment, being good people, helping everybody out. Do you know what I mean? Working hard in training, shooting sessions, all that kind of stuff. Um, and he said, listen, I appreciate literally everything you've done. You've been top class. So you're going to play in the last final game against Costa Rica. And I was like, Right, mate. What you are? Well, what a yeah. guy! I, yeah, I, I, yeah. I was like, wow, what a guy! So yeah, the, to be able to sort of come off training and ring my wife, ring my mates, ring my mum and dad, and tell them that I'm going to be playing the game, they were like, that is. Staying on the international topic, what was it like getting your call up for England? 
the fir- very first one. Yeah, yeah. So, so you, you know, you, you get you get the phone call or something yeah, goes up to the, the very what, first what, time. What actually happened? Okay, the very first time I was um, I was on holiday actually in Dubai with uh, with Kate, and it was it was so hot. It was miserable. It was forty degrees. We, it was too hot. We couldn't really enjoy it. And so you um, know nothing about England. I know nothing like, about anything. At nothing. The no. Okay. And. One of the England goalkeepers, I think it was Rob Green, got injured in a friendly game. He pulled, he did a really bad injury actually. He pulled like the ligament tendon, everything off the bone in his groin. It was horrible. Yeah. Um, so I got a text message from a number basically saying, hi Ben, this is this is Michelle, the England secretary. Um, mm. I'm going to give you a ring like in the next few minutes, basically. Yeah. Um, you're, 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 you've been called up to the England senior team for training next week and these dates sort of thing. And I got it I straight away. I was like, wow, what on earth? And like, okay, I wasn't yeah. sure because it's just a number. You never know, do you? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I showed it to Kay and I was, she was like, well, just wait and see when they call. Then she rung anyway and it was Michelle. And uh, anybody that's been with the England team will know Michelle. Michelle's okay. like the secretary. She's brilliant. Yeah. She's actually like, she runs the place basically. Incredible. Um, so she was like, no, listen, we'll sort everything out. And um, I was just, I, at, the mo- at the time, I was like, this holiday cost me loads of money. <laughs> did, they, did, they so, did they sort you out? <laughs> yeah, they paid for it all. It was wicked. Yeah. Um, but like, we were two days into our holiday, a two-week holiday. And I'm thinking, I'll come to Dubai, like business class flight. This has cost me about 10 grand. Like, <laughs> yeah. Any chance of you lot sorting this out? She was like, oh, don't worry about that. We'll sort out that. That's fine. And they did. Like, big shout That's out. Like, yeah. they, they booked the flight the next day, everything like that. Everything sorted. First later class. On. It was business. It was nice. Yeah, it was lovely. Yeah. And I remember it was funny because I remember landing back at uh, Heathrow or whatever it was, and there was like a there was like a cameraman waiting for me, like uh, from one of the like uh, one of the newspapers or whatever. And he, to be fair, he was cool. He was like, we landed, and I was walking through the thing, and he went, "Bye, Ben. I'm from the whatever. Do you mind? If, I'm Sky Sports. So do you mind if I just like video you walking through the terminal?" I was like. Yeah, it's fine, yeah. mate. Sweet as a nut. We just got off a seven-hour flight. It looked like a bag of shit, but it's fine. Like, so he's just like following us, and I was like, oh god. Anyway, but yeah, that was the very first time I got Incredible. caught in things, and that was under Sven. That was yeah. that was under Sven uh, Goran Eriksson, and uh, I didn't really have too much to do to him. I was a young kid in the team, kind of thing. I never, you know, what I mean, I was, I was only there for like ten days for the, I think yeah, it was yeah. the World Cup or something. But um, no, it was a wicked experience. That was so my cool. very first day. It was mad though. Was Michelle mad. must have the coolest job ever because she gets to phone up everybody, you know, people, and and say, yeah. you know, you're, normally it's just a text message. Yeah. You normally yeah, yeah. don't you normally oh, really? don't you don't like so any for obviously for new players kind of thing she'd have to ring them and speak to them but normally when you get called if you're, if yeah, you're th- that's what i'm on about yeah, for the very first like, one calling up that's a new prize yeah that must be incredible because yeah. you're making their life exactly like, that is it will be akin to like ringing as somebody and saying as you've won the lottery as a footballer playing yeah. for your for the national team pinnacle is, pinnacle isn't it yeah. it's, it's number one so um, a lot of the team, players that will get called into the team obviously we're going to be young kids as well you're yeah. talking 18, 19, 20 years old and to hear the excitement yeah, on the other man. end of the phone must be a wicked feeling that must be yeah and what a cool job yeah really really cool Th- job. this is the thing I find interesting talking to you about finding out these stories the little details Michelle you yeah. know and, and the phone calls and the text she gets to do yeah that, that stuff to yeah, me normally it's just really a text honestly it's normally just a yeah. text so the, if there's an England match next week for example you'll get a text on a Wednesday or Thursday and say you've been selected for the men's senior team report here at this time at yeah. this bring your boots bring your shin pads goalie gloves all that kind of stuff um, yeah that's that's how it works who were that the fun. characters in the England dressing room when you were there then for sure because I I remember watching the send off before the World Cup, which was Jamaica at Old Trafford. Yeah, and that was five nil with cr- Crouchy, Crouchy when he was did, doing the robot. Did and stuff the like robot. That. Yeah, that, that was that sort of. That was a good. Do you know what? I actually really enjoyed them sort of players. To be fair, like you say, Crouchy. You've, Crouchy's the man. Oh, like, he's the man. Like, need to get him on the pod. We do need to get him on the pod. He would be yeah, wicked Crouchy, on the pod. Crouchy, please come on. <laughs> Crouchy, please come on. We love you, mate, honestly. like, But he, he deserves everything he gets. Like, someone like Peter Crouch deserves everything he gets because he is just the nicest bloke. Honestly, he's just the nicest bloke. And he's so calm, so laid back. He's got no airs or graces. He is what he is. And you can see that he's not acting, is he? You can just see that's yeah, just who he is. Like a nice guy. So, yeah. yeah, well done, Pete. You deserve it, Geese. You deserve everything, yeah, mate. sure. Very good, very good. So, uh Mr. Hodgson. Yeah. Then who was next up at West Brom? Uh, we it was Steve Clark. So we had a year under oh, Steve yeah. Clark. The season we did actually really, really well. I think we were fourth at Christmas time, um, which is unheard of for a team like West Brom. Did really, really well. It was a strong season. That was Romelu Lukaku season. What um, a player. What a player, mate. It took him... I, I think he'll even admit to this as well. It probably took him three or four months to find his feet at West Brom. But when he found it, my gosh... Lads, yeah. phenom, like a beast, mm. an absolute beast. Because was he there? He wasn't there at the same time as Anelka, was he? Uh, yes, he was. So up front for West Brom, Nicholas Anelka and Romelu Lukaku, incredible. <sighs> what a joke! Incredible. 
Um, yeah, he was. He, he, you could just tell. You knew. Like he, he finished the season so strongly that it was. He was either going to go back to Chelsea and rip it up, or he was going to get a monster move. And he, he got a monster move. Um, but he, he's lovely bloke as well. Honestly, Romelu Lukaku, yeah. one of the biggest players in the world at the minute. Yeah. One of the nicest blokes you can meet as well. Just yeah. so calm, chill, lovely, open happy to like speak to people help people like people like that deserve everything they've got yeah yeah yeah, sure. yeah. skip forward a little bit and then you're into tony pulis era tony pulis era um got a really bad rep from the west brom fans they did not like tony pulis in the end they did not like him but i can only say from what i saw up close and personal with what a wicked bloke i know i've said that about most people on this pod so far but wicked bloke honestly tony yeah, yeah. pulis what a guy loves his cycling he was just black and white he would tell you exactly how it was if you've been shit he would put an arm around you and said son you've been shit you're not playing next week and that's how it was at least you knew where you stood with him honestly I don't yeah. think there's not many players that will have too many bad things to say about Tony Pulis honestly he was he would just tell you plain and simple what he wanted from you and that was it and his style of play was his style of play everybody knew that it, like you were getting the ball forward as quickly as you could and it was going to be a bunch of big lads and we were going to try and score a goal and then just hang on for a 1-0 win but, but you, you it stayed was effective in the, you stayed in the league every year for sure and I remember we used to come and watch you in that it was boring. Yeah, it was. I know. It was I understand. I, for, for as a goalkeeper, it was not boring. I promise you, it was wicked. Because if somebody passed the ball back to me, I knew what I was doing with it. I wasn't trying to clip it out to the right wing, left wing, left back, left right back. I was nailing it as hard as I could <laughs> up to that six foot four, six foot five centre forward, and he was trying to get it down. And it was you just learn to live within your those, those things. You, you didn't yeah. have. To, you, there was no sort of like. Plan B, Plan C. It was literally that and that only. So as a goalkeeper, it was super easy. Like you stop the ball going in the back of the net and you kick it as far as you can. Um, but I do understand the frustration from the fans because it can't be great to watch at times. So obviously we've mentioned the two lads up front and then you, you had some really good players in your time at West Brom. Mate, we you? just had, do you know what we had? We had the sort of, you just, we just had a British core of players. We had a British core of players, and there's a lot to be said about that. You know, you know exactly what you're going to get from them. They might not have the best flair or skills or speed or technique, but you know you're going to get seven, eight out of ten every single week from them because of just pure effort, pure work rate, and that's what we were. We we knew that we were just going to outwork teams. So the likes of people like Shane Long, he would not work stop course, running. Work work course. Course. He would run his tits off every single game. He was the best at jumping for a ball. I've ever seen in my life. Like as a goalie, playing against Shane Long would be a nightmare because he would shut you down. He wouldn't give you a second's breath. Uh, he scored the. He actually scored the fastest goal in Premier League That's history right. against me. I've let that goal in. <laughs> You've because, got some records. You have. I know. It's how cool is that? Because we kicked off. The ball came back to Craig Kafka. Craig Kafka went to clear it up the pitch. Shane Long shut him down, hit his chest, bounced down to him. He chipped me. It's a goal. Five and a half seconds, something silly like that. Yeah. Outrageous. But that is him in a nutshell. That's exactly what he did. And we had loads of them players. Brunty. Uh, Chris Brunt, one of the best left foots, by the way, I've ever played with. Ever played with. It was incredible. West Brom fans know what I'm talking about here. Best left foots I've ever played with. Graham Dorans, James Morrison, Gareth yeah. McCauley, Jonas Olsen. You know what you're going to get from these players. And that goes a long way, you know. Being reliable and knowing exactly what you're going to get from every single player week in week out it's worth sure. its weight in gold Gareth McCauley w was seriously underrated I honestly think one of the best free signings in the history of ever he was incredible Craig Dawson Craig Dawson again cheapest chips we got from Rochdale but he's a workhorse he's a dog he will put in the hard yards you know you're going to get 6, 7, 8 out of 10 out from him every single week absolutely fantastic and then it was a hard one, wasn't it, when West Brom got relegated? Yeah, for sure. That was your home for a very, very long time, and you're very, very close to the club. And yeah. it was a, it was, a, it was a tough one for you, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was. It was a tough one because I, I always said that I wanted to finish my career at West Brom because I loved it there so much. Like I say, it was home, and I think the, the thing was though that I was so set in my ways at West Brom that I got probably a little bit too comfortable, and the move to Watford came about, and. It was a chance, obviously, to first and foremost to get back in the Premier League and play Premier League uh, football and again. And a team that was very close a, to your a, heart. A very nice team, a team I'd been to before. I knew the lay of the land. I knew a few of the lads already. And it wasn't so much of a big transition. But I always said I didn't want to leave West Brom. But a few things changed behind the scenes and people were promised to be looked after. Not they, It wasn't just people. They were my friends. They were my best friends. They were lifelong friends that... 
I knew and loved and I'd been to work with for the last five, six years. And they were told one thing that they were going to get contracts on looked after and this and that. And then they reneged on those promises and didn't do what they said they were going to do, basically. And that left a bit of a sad, sad taste in my mouth, really. But, it, you know, I'll, I'll still, I'll always look back on West Brom as a really, really fun time for me because it was a lovely club. The fans were so good. They were, the fans were absolutely incredible, in fact. And um, no, definitely the the highlight of my whole career will be my my one big long stint at West Brom. Yeah, and I think like that was the time you mentioned it before, but we, like our kids are similar ages and that's when they started going to the football together. Yeah. And like every season at West Brom, you'd buy your kids and like my lads yeah. the kit and they'd go to little football training together in their baggies kits yeah. and it was nice because that like that's when our kids like even now would like with Louis and with George and they they always look for West Brom don't they for sure it's the like say but when obviously I'm at Watford now but and I'll look for the the Watford score first your your kids will my kids will look for the Watford score the second score they'll look for is West Brom for sure because we obviously it's a shame they've just been relegated but they're again a massive club and they, I know for a fact they'll bounce back and it's interesting as a dynamic so kind of people always say to me who do you support and I'm like well <laughs> Watford because kind of Ben's there and I know it sounds a little bit but as a fan and a friend, like, you know, that all my family are Wolves fans growing up and, you know, some of your family are and whatnot. But when you're close to a player, it, like a player itself, it kind of goes out the window to a lesser or greater extent because you think you signed for uh, Watford back in the day and we go and watch home and away and you grow an affinity to that team massively. And then you go to Blues and Blues and Wolves, West Brom and Wolves, and football fans will hate to hear this, like, but you kind of follow where you play, and then, For like, sure, yeah. as a Wolves fan historically, and then you go and oh, West Brom today, and you know, West, you play for West Brom, so you look for West Brom, you support West Brom. Oh, I was a Tottenham fan as a kid. I was a big Tottenham fan. My brother, dilutes. my brother made me be a Tottenham fan. But as soon as you become a professional footballer. You have to forget all that. You do. You just forget all that. And but that you, goes to your network around you as exactly, well. Exactly. It does. It does. It spreads out as well to your network around you. So like I say, my, my kids will always be West Brom fans. We will always look out for Blues. We'll always look out for Watford. We'll, you know, it's the way that yeah. it goes. Yeah, you will yeah, always sure. look out for them. I look out for Watford now. Yeah, for you know? sure. You do. I do, yeah. honestly. Yeah. You I edit, the, you edit like the videos, yeah, mate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you know when the Watford games are. <laughs> I know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, but you, you know what I mean. It's just like, I, I now care about what for sure. I really do. Um, I think the funny thing in with, with the Cycling GK is, I think we have turned a lot of oh neutrals God, yeah. into Watford fans, into just to see how the club are going. Do you know what I mean? A lot of people want to see how we're performing. Yeah, how comments, we're comment, them. comment below if you are turning into a Watford fan um, and you check the scores every week. And, and then tell us your favourite player. I pretty sure I know who you're going to see say your favorite player is but and it can't be me obviously don't say me I know one player who I'm sure you'll say it will be but um I do I think we've turned a lot of neutral football fans yeah. into Watford fans and it's really great because you're taking it to obviously we launched the channel during covid and it's just the three of us it's that nice. run the channel and it is really nice and I look we are still winging it we are. we are even the channel we're winging it aren't we yeah. we, we, we like bounce ideas off each other and go should we just try that yeah sod it let's go yeah, but we have number a lot one of fun sport podcast in number the UK one <laughs> but we have a lot of fun don't we we have a huge Love amount it. of fun and, yeah. and with one eye on you know you, you are 38 years old you are an absolute dinosaur bless you no. um, but with one eye on the future you're not going to be playing for five six years That that's a fact heck no and and it's a nice transition, isn't it, at Cycling GK? Because obviously you've, you've committed 100% to football. You know, it's match day, you're in. You're on in the zone. But I'm justifying it for you. No, you don't. Know, because it is that, it's what I said earlier about when I was at Man United. I can't live and breathe football. I can't. No. I, need other, I need other things to do. I need other things to take my mind off it and turn my attention to other things. And this, for me, has been the biggest sort of eye-opener ever. Honestly, YouTube, the world of the community... The possibilities, outrageous. Honestly, yeah, I yeah, absolutely sure. buzz off it so, so much. The, the the thing for me is like the interaction between it all, the interaction between us and the community and what they want to see and how they feel part of it. They feel part of the story. Mm -hmm. They love the characters. Basler. They love Basler. Oh, Will gosh. Hughes. They love Will Hughes. So Watford back in the big league, in the Premier League this season, shaping up nicely. Pre-season's going well. 
and you've signed some good players. We have signed some good players, mate. Some really decent signings. Um, Josh King, really, really good centre forward. Honestly, he's hit the ground running as well. Looks really sharp in training. A uh, couple nice midfielders. Uh, there's a guy called Imran Loser, who I think we can expect a he's lot from. what? Imran Loser. He, L-O-U-Z-A, but he's a baller. Honestly, you wait and see. He's an absolute baller. Well, I hope he is, because if he doesn't, He's, uh, trust me he's a boiler um, winner. Come but on, no we, we, we know we know the Premier League's tough like I, me personally I've played I think 18 seasons in the Premier League I know what it's about I know it's yeah. tough and it, you, you need to be you need to be at 90 100% every single match day Danny it, Rose Danny Rose fantastic signing absolutely fantastic signing what a guy what a he's just a leader he's a leader you know he talks a lot he's got experience and people look up to him you need those kind of guys they are invaluable for a team like us going back into the Premier League so yeah it's going to be tough I think on a personal level we're just going to have to wait and see guys honestly I'm enjoying myself I'm having a lovely time I get to make my videos um, we can expect some wicked stuff from Cycling GK this year honestly we're going to be able to go to some of the big stadiums the big arenas show you what all the Liverpool's Arsenal Man City Man United show you what it looks like behind the scenes there do you know what I mean I want to go and poke in doors that I've never been in before um, <laughs> it's going to be class I'm going to get shirts galore I'm going to give giveaways galore love it um, yes. it's going to be absolutely wicked because the the I think people have just bought into the cycling GK so much you know the the people that they feel real connections with the people that you don't normally get to see at football clubs like Baz, the, the the coach driver, like big Baz, big Baz. Come on. Let, can we just guy. talk about him for a minute? Yeah, let's talk about Big Baz. I think Big Baz deserves his own legend. section, doesn't he? What yes. a guy! So, so obviously this is a podcast, and it's going to go out on Spotify and Apple and and everywhere else. But for those that watch the Cycling GK YouTube channel, Basler, Big Basler. Tell us about Basler and his rise to fame. So Basler is the coach driver, the Watford FC coach driver, a legend of a bloke. Honestly, just the most. Down to earth, nice. He's he's um, like a South Londoner. He's like proper big Millwall. Basler. Millwall he is. He's proper Millwall. Um, but he's just lovely, honestly. He's he'll go to the end of the earth to do whatever you need you doing for. He's absolutely top. And class. he's blown up. And he has blown up on the cycling GK. He has set up his own Instagram profile called Big. Basler, Watford. What is it? Put it as high. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be on the screen. If you're, watching like, on, if you're watching on YouTube now, that is his handle. Go like and have a big look. Baz, he got like Watford 20, driver. I think he's got like 22,000 uh, 22, yeah. followers. Tell us the story the, about... It's a funny... <laughs> I've got a couple of funny stories actually about Bizler, about big, big Basler because the very first time we put his Instagram... He had just set up this in, new Instagram yeah. account and you had just put it on the screen on one of the videos, hadn't you? And I was like, Basler's Instagram's on there go and follow him so anyway we were at an away game actually and the uh, the video dropped I think it was on a Friday and we we're away in this hotel and uh, I've said to Baz earlier in the day mate listen the um, the video is going to drop today so you know you might get a few followers on Instagram from it and he was like oh brilliant 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 so anyway the video dropped at about five o'clock I went down for dinner at seven o'clock he's there like in a fluster like big basler's <laughs> flustering like he's all over the shop he's like ben m my phone's going m and he's holding it and he's doing my phone's doing this like he's ju it just keeps popping like he follows me he follows i went shut up he went i've got five thousand followers <laughs> <laughs> and he's five thousand notifications yeah, five thousand notifications so he's like he's like, he's like i don't know what to do with it. and uh, he's got uh, at this point all the other staff like the physios and the are all laughing their heads off at him looking at him going well you need to disable him doing this and everybody's buzzing off it it's incredible um but yeah it, it was so funny to see him and he was like oh, what do i do and then he was i was like trying to explain to him what pictures to put on and how to put them. so i think yeah. his daughter helps him a lot to be fair now he said to me his daughter's like helped him to show him what he needs to put and the pictures he needs to Brilliant. put and all that kind of stuff but honestly what an absolutely about him wasn't like, his daughter that like, made those cakes for you as well yeah she's the girl who made the uh the cycling g yeah. cake she's made quite a few cakes for us to be fair like we've, he's always bringing them on the coach they are world class as well absolutely Basler is a top so guy. Basler's got more followers on Instagram than the Watford manager. The Watford manager. A lot of the Watford players. Yeah, a lot of the Watford players. <laughs> one, one funny story, actually. Again, we were we were at lunch and um, and Basler, obviously it's an away game and we're sitting around the table and stuff and Basler's on the table next to us here. And um, but we were just we were all just joking about the fact he's got like 15,000 Instagram followers at the time or whatever. And Ben Wilmot sitting on our table, young lad Ben Wilmot, just signed for Stoke City. Great, England great. England under 21 England international. England under 21 international. Great prospect for the future, honestly. Massive prospect. And he's, he's sitting there on our table and he's gone... <laughs> He's got more followers than me. And we've kind of laughed as if he's joking. We've gone, seriously? He's gone, yeah, 
so we so now we got to the point where we're saying Basla you got more followers than Ben Wilmot over here and he started chuckling he goes do you want me to give you a shout out on one of my pictures <laughs> <laughs> hey I tell you what I had an email I rang you both didn't I I had an email not long ago and it's and it was titled Basler. Yeah. And it was Tom. I don't know what I've done to upset Basler because I only ever put positive things and comment positive things on his Instagram post, but I'm blocked. Shut I'm, up. I'm devastated type thing. What can you do to help? Can you speak to him? And I'm like Listen, I kind of run the Cycling GK That's channel hard. here. I can't do you know run. what I mean? I'm not going to ring Basler up and be like, hey, unblock. He wouldn't have done that on purpose. No, Guaranteed exactly. He would have been pressing buttons. Yeah, <laughs> Basler would have just been pressing buttons going, what am I doing? And yeah, he would have yeah, accidentally yeah. blocked it. He wouldn't do that on purpose, I promise you guys, honestly. So guys, I absolutely buzzed off that. Yeah. I may be sweating my tits off because it's roasting hot in here, but I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy it. I that. am sat in a pool of sweat. It's hot, isn't oh, it? Oh man, I cannot wait to get upstairs and get in that air con. It's lovely upstairs. Yeah, upstairs yeah it's nice beautiful. upstairs. It's been fun. It's been a lot of fun For chatting sure. with the boys, uh, looking down, you know, trip down memory lane, looking at the future and um, exciting times ahead. So guys, thank you for listening. For those of you watching on YouTube, make sure you give this a big old thumbs up. Hit that subscribe button. Guys, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed that. Brilliant. That was absolutely Love top class. Note. Picking through the bones of my 20 year long football career. The Cycling GK, the Foscast podcast is going to be even bigger and better next year. I have no doubts about that whatsoever. The only way is up. Legends. Love it. Woo! Cheers, guys. Peace out.